Today, our top story tonight, studying... Hello, good evening. BBC South East can reveal that schools in Kent, Sussex and Surrey are facing a recruitment crisis with the number of teacher vacancies higher than in any other region in the country. Government figures show that in 2010-11, there were 27 vacancies in the region. By 2015, that had risen to 75, and in 2022-23, it had reached 276. The BBC understands one school has been teaching multiple classes together in the school hall, a practice described as educationally unethical. But as Rosie Blunt reports, the Department for Education insists that schools now have more teachers than ever before. All of you. Well, joining us now is Siobhan Lowe. She's a former head teacher and an education consultant from Surrey. Siobhan, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This is quite a sad situation, isn't it? That the profession just cannot retain teachers. What is going so wrong in your view? Um, I think... I think what's happened, yeah. but also we've had lots of teachers speaking out over the years about burnout, workload, they're just not paid enough for the work that they're expected to do. What, what's happened to the workload? Where has this gone so wrong? I don't think... A man from Surrey has been found guilty of murdering Met Police Sergeant Matt Rantner. 25-year-old Louis de Zoyza shot the former head coach at East Grinstead Rugby Club at a custody block in Croydon in 2020, having smuggled in a gun. He had claimed diminished responsibility but was unanimously convicted after a jury decided that he pulled the antique weapons trigger deliberately. Claire Starr has been hearing from people who knew Matt from his time at the rugby club and how it's going from strength to strength thanks to his legacy. Matt was a, a government minister has called for a snap inspection of a Sussex school after a teacher was reportedly recorded telling a pupil she was despicable for saying that it would be weird if a classmate was to identify as a cat. Women and Equalities Minister Kemi Badenoch has written to the school's watchdog Ofsted asking for an inspection of Rye College after the incident saying it raises issues about safeguarding at the school. Well, our reporter Linda Hardy joins me now. And Linda, hello. This follows a a recording that was leaked online, doesn't it? That's right, yeah. Ellie, the recording showed a discussion in which the teacher appeared to brand comments made by a pupil as despicable after the student had suggested that the idea of another pupil identifying as a cat or another animal was crazy. Well, that prompted a discussion about self-identity, lots of uh, media interest in this, MPs raised the issue in Parliament, and then the Labour leader, when asked, Sir Keir Starmer said that children should be told to identify as children. Well, now the Equalities Minister, Kemi Badenoch, has said that a statement the school said it has been in touch with the Department for Education, it's met them and been through exactly what happened before, during and after that recording, and it remains in touch with the government and will ensure any appropriate action is taken. It also says that it supports Ofsted, it's welcome to come in any time it wants to, and confirms that no children at Rye College currently identify as a cat or any other animal. It says it's committed to offering an inclusive inclusive education to its pupils and it also supports its teachers in engaging in discussion. Linda, thank you. A man has been jailed for life with a minimum of 23 years after pleading guilty to the murder of a woman in Eastbourne. Tony King, who's 60 and from Cornfield Terrace, stabbed Sabrina. ...have found the mobile phone being sought in connection with a double murder investigation in New Haven following Exanterbury died after doctors missed a fatal abdominal infection, a coroner has concluded. Marion Llewellyn, who was 66, was sent home from the Kent and Canterbury Urgent Care Centre in terrible pain... When and according to experts, a scan would have revealed her condition and her life could have been saved. Today, her son said he hopes the trust will make changes. Sarah Smith reports. This program. More than a game after an inspiring... Well, as you've just seen, it seems the weather is set fair for another fine weekend, which will be a relief to the organisers of the Eastbourne Rothesay International, which gets underway properly tomorrow. Qualifying at Devonshire Park begins tomorrow, and from Monday, we'll see seven of the top ten women in the world in action during what is a key grass court fixture in the warm-up to Wimbledon. Well, Alison Ferns is there live for us now. Hello, Alison. Looks beautiful down there. And some top-quality tennis on offer. Oh, it offer. really is. 
Absolutely, Ellie. I have to say, Eastbourne has caught tennis fever. Just walking around the town, you see shops and restaurants with windows decorated with all sorts of tennis memorabilia. You can't move for rackets. But I think that shows just how important the tournament is to the town in terms of the revenue it raises for the local economy. For the next week, the eyes of the world are going to be on Eastbourne and it couldn't look more beautiful. I mean, look at that grass. I've got proper lawn envy. I've been here today looking into the last minute preparations happening at Devonshire Park. The wait is nearly over. Tomorrow these stands will be full of tennis fans eager to see some top sporting action. Devonshire Park has hosted this event for 49 years and in fact the new tournament director Rebecca James remembers coming here as a little girl. I was seven years old when I first came to Devonshire Park um, as a spectator myself and then I suppose the inspiration that the, the female players that I watched at the time um, you know, gave me a love and a passion for the sport that I've uh, been able to forge a career in. One of the unique aspects of this tournament is just how close spectators can get to the action. I mean, you could literally touch the players. I mean, don't, obviously. But there is an intimate feel to the event. It's a true festival of tennis, with people enjoying pims and strawberries on the lawn whilst watching top athletes. Let's not forget, when this isn't being used as a venue for a world sporting event, it's home to the local tennis club, which Chris is chairman of. It's incredible the transformation in the space of three weeks when we're playing tennis on these magnificent courts, standing on the balcony over there, you can see the whole club, and now this transformation is absolutely stunning. It's wonderful. It's very exciting. It's thrilling to see such, um, such a space for all the spectators and wonderful courts for the players. It's always attracted big names. In fact, Serena Williams wowed crowds on centre court last year. It's a thrill because she's got such a presence on court and she's got more trophies and championships than anyone else, even the men, you know, she's a wonderful player. With seven of the top ten women in the world taking part and with the defending men's champion Taylor Fritz returning, it's going to be interesting to see who makes the cut. The event also has the rather dubious honour of being one of the only tournaments where a player's serve could be disrupted by a swooping seagull. It also is known for throwing up one or two surprises. At this time of year where there are so many tournaments coming along pretty much like buses, if a high-ranking player suffers an early exit from a prior tournament, they sometimes look for a late entry here at Eastbourne. So watch this space. We'll bring you full coverage throughout the week. Look forward to that. Alison, thank you so much. I also have Lorna Envy. Thank you. Now, when Mary Savage was a young woman, she sailed to Hong Kong to marry her fiancé, Colin. More than 70 years later, Mary is in a care home in Maidstone, where the staff heard her talking about that romantic journey and decided to turn her room into a recreation of her cabin on the ship. Mary, who's now 95, says that seeing it was like walking back to the past, as Ian Palmer reports. Lovely story. Now, it's already been an inspiring season for Brighton and Hove Albion's blind football, having won the league. This weekend, they're going for the double, with an FA Cup final at St George's Park, which will be shown live on the TV. Run by the Albion in the community, the charity associated with the club, it's more than a game to many of the players. Our sports reporter, James Dunn, went to meet some of them. Brother John Hammond is with us, and it's another sunny one, John. Sure is, Ali. How long can we keep? Oh dear. Well, I'll be making the most of it then, John. Thank you very much. That's it from me for the moment. Linda Hardy will be back with your late news at 10.30. Bye-bye.